So welcome, Dwayne, to our committee. Um, this is a, it was a subcommittee meeting um, where I, this is uh, for those on the committee, this was subcommittee for chapter two. I had reached out to, to Dwayne to join us today um, in response to discussion that the subcommittee was having um, on the future. So um, we're, we're trying to set the stage for 2035 and beyond. Um, so basically, NSF has asked us to recommend research and infrastructure needs um, over the next decade that will position NSF strongly when we arrive at 2035. Um, and so we were talking about, well, what does this mean? Um, and we thought uh, it might be good to bring in someone to, to talk to us about that. So I know Dwayne has some thoughts. Um, he recently has published a book that I shared with you all, and I can share it again in the chat or um, also by email. Um, and I know we're all really looking forward to hearing from him. I've got a, a brief introduction. There's, mm -hmm. there's so much <laughs> I found online, but um, Dwayne is an internationally recognized author, speaker, and social visionary who explores the deeper trends that are transforming our world. He has an MBA um, and an MA in economic history. He's worked as a senior social scientist on the staff of the Presidential Commission on the American Future and is a senior social scientist at the think tank SRI International. He's co-authored numerous studies with them on the long range future for clients such as the president's science advisor, um, the, NS the NSF and others. He received the Peace Prize of Japan in recognition of his contribution to a global vision, consciousness and lifestyle that fosters a more sustainable and spiritual culture. Uh, Dwayne is the co-director of Choosing Project Earth, and that's, again, that publication that I just mentioned. Um, so, yeah, so I asked Dwayne to join us to just kind of help us set the stage for what, where we're trying to go with, with our report. Um, so, Dwayne, I'll open the floor to you, um, you know, and, and committee members, if you have any questions along the way. Dwayne, would you like them to ask them along the way or save them for the end? Probably uh, save them because there are so many questions okay. uh, we could easily get off track. And yep. uh, really, okay. really, uh, there are three things I would like to to talk, share with you, I, I suppose. Um, first of all, as I mentioned at the outset, gratitude that you're actually doing this work. Uh, so then secondly, I'd like to look at um, scenarios. Uh, visions of the future that are database scholarly, uh, rigorous, uh, not fantasy. I went, the, the work I did at the Stanford Research Institute, NSF, and so on, those are rigorous scholarly studies. And um, so I want to look at the future um, through scenarios. Uh, I then want to take a bit of time based upon the last half century of experience uh, working with clients like NSF and such, and talk about uh, the, not the limits to growth for material systems, but the limits to capacity for social systems to deal with that. And I think we have a growing mismatch between uh, the material demands for coping with, with uh, like the climate crisis and so on, and the governing systems that, that look at how we can remedy the, the problems that we're seeing. And um, so that's a critical mismatch, I feel. And then uh, thirdly, uh, the idea brought up by the UN uh, Climate Secretary uh, uh, saying that the public needs a stronger voice in this whole process. And um, so I I would like to make a suggestion in that regard. So going back to um futures and uh scenarios uh shortly after oh, 1972 and uh, 73 moving on from that presidential science uh the commission looking at the future uh, i began working for the sanford research institute and uh, early on the first few months i was there getting oriented and their work on the future studies. I met this gentleman who said to me, uh, and he was an older man, he had been working for his life at the CIA doing future studies. And uh, he said to me, you know, Dwayne, 
the future will not end with a bang. It will end with a proposal for research. And, uh, and little did I know here at the time, a crux in human history, uh, we're offering proposals for research rather, rather than responding to the bang, uh, uh, collision of all of these trends that are uh, afoot. Now, uh, a few years later in uh, 1975, I was doing a study for the uh, National Science Foundation and uh, paying it, and it was really for the president's science advisor. And he wanted to know, look, uh, what are the trends that we're not looking for? Uh, what is going to wipe us out from the blind side because we're not looking? And he said, don't tell me what I already know. Tell me what I don't know. And so that was a year-long study into uh, the unknown. That was the intent. What will wipe us out from the blind side if we're not looking? And um, we went to a briefing in 1975 at the Department of Energy, and uh, just as four of us, and um, two then uh, pre our presenters from the department. And at the end of their data streams and all the rest, I finally said, look, what does this mean to you? What, what, what's the bottom line here? And he paused and he said, well, my guess is looking at this data, in 30 to 40 years, we're going to be in big trouble if we don't pay attention. And he said, we could get wiped out from the blind, the blind side, but 30 or 40 years, that's plenty of time for the political process to really handle this growing problem. And so it was not included in the um, uh, report to the science advisor, for example. But that was in 1975. And what is that? Uh, 45 years or so uh, ago, we knew this was coming. We knew this time was coming. And I've been watching it all these decades and now here we are. We are at a critical juncture. And the best image for my view of what's happening is that of a roller coaster. And we've been on a ride. And the first part of the ride was going up. And it was like growth, growth, growth. We're going up. We're going up. Look at the view. We got ah. Uh. And we came to the top of that roller coaster and people, ah, peace. Look at uh, the wonder of the creation. And then go a little bit of movement and we're going over the other side. And as we go over the other side, we're going to go from a gentle movement. And all of a sudden, we're going to start picking up speed so much that the, we're going to feel like the bottom is dropping out. That's where we are now, in my estimation. Just putting all of this years and years of research together, we're at the top of the roller coaster of growth. And uh, we are now in tremendous overshoot, uh, population resources and, and, and the rest. And, and it can't sustain us. Uh, estimates are we're about 4 billion people in overshoot right now, beyond what the earth can, uh, its natural systems can support. Uh, we're in massive overshoot, and we are about to see the bottom drop out, in my estimation, in the time frame that you folks are now required uh, to describe. It doesn't mean this year, next year, but by 2030, I expect the economic, uh, ecological, social, and all of the other uh, breakdowns that we're beginning to see to really uh, allow the whole world system to come apart. Uh, and I came to this conclusion of a really rapid, massive breakdown very reluctantly. I, I won't say that. Uh, this is not the view of the future I wanted to be writing. This is, um, I was pushed to this by the, by the data, by the information and just mountains of it. And but my sense is by 2030, uh, somewhere in there, uh, we're going to see real breakdown and uh, countries around the world, banks around the world, corporations around the world, and on and on, uh, go into free fall. 
because the system cannot hold. And then we get into systems analysis. And I want to speak to that in just a moment. My sense is uh, free fall will only last so long. And then we're going to, we hit, uh, we hit, <laughs> We hit the ground, and uh, by the 2040, uh, my sense is, once again, this is database. Just dig in there. It's all there. By 2040, uh, we go from free fall to sorrow uh, because uh, the potential for great uh, dying, great migrations, great burning, and so on, just massive dislocations on the land as well as in the oceans. Uh, by 2040, uh, I feel it will be too late to make meaningful adjustments, adaptations, actions, uh, because the, the, the economic base won't be there as strongly to do that. The governing capacities will be uh, broken if there's not trust that's been built before that, and so on. So my, my sense is by 2040, uh, the potential for either... Uh, breakthrough, we find a way through all of this, and I think we can, and that's the work that I've been doing to say, this isn't disasters, this is breakdowns like this have happened, not of this scale, they happen all through history. Well, we keep moving, let's go on through. Other people are saying, no, we're, we're doomed. And I'm saying, we're not doomed. They say, yes, we are, and we're going to prepare for that doom. We're going to adapt to doom. Uh, and another community says, well, uh, the only way to handle this is authoritarian stringent measures, measures of control. And uh, so what we are describing now in this book, Choosing Earth, is that middle path uh, between uh, just absolute breakdown on the one hand and extreme control and authoritarianism, perhaps enabled with AI on the other. And so, but it requires us as human beings, to take a whole lot more responsibility than what we're doing now. Uh, and that's the challenge that I see. And that's really a challenge of communication. And that's why I want to bring that in uh, at the end. So um, quickly stated, that's my overview of, of scenarios. Um, there's so much that we could discuss about that. But uh, let me pause for just a moment. And uh, Kelly, do you have any um, any questions at this point before we transition a little? Yeah, if, if you if anyone wants to raise their hand, if they have a question. Um... We can come back to uh, all, yeah. all questions. OK, um, I'm not seeing any, Dwayne, so. OK, good get the whole <clears throat> picture. Um, I noticed uh, one key element of your uh, work is establishing a framework for looking at what is happening. And that was key uh, to the work that we've done. And we, again and again, we were pushed by our framework towards a greater uh, perspective and responsibility, if you will. The framework is uh, wide, deep, and long as opposed to narrow, shallow, and short. And if you look at what most corporations do, what most academics do, and so on, it is to say, well, let's narrow this down so we can really get a hold of it. Uh, let's not look too deep into, into values because we're a part of a, a stable institution with uh, relatively known values. And let's not look too far into the future because who knows the next three to five years and what you end up with is a problem uh, just encapsulated uh, in a way with it so narrow, so shallow, so short, uh, that it doesn't allow uh, a real exploration. And so again and again, we said, look, we have to look wide uh, beyond, let's say, climate change, the species extinction, mass migrations, on and on and on. We have to look deep. Are there other values that are going to be at work here to transform how we can go through this time? We have to look long beyond, say, 10 years to really see the dynamics at work and understand how critical the, the turning uh, is right now. Uh, so why deep and long rather than narrow, shallow, and short? That's a, is a quick summation, but a very critical and painful 
uh, exercise for most, <laughs> most many institutions. Um, so, um, systems change. Uh, what I saw uh, was putting on the hat of the person at NSF, let's say, who said, okay, now what am I going to fund? Uh, what study could I fund? Um, how can we how can we look at this? What what are the most critical? The most critical element to me is the system's complexity uh, in encountering uh, the complexity of natural systems. And we, we can do all of these studies on natural systems and get the really accurate, useful data. But then that data, just like we're seeing with 1.5 being exceeded and all the rest, uh, that data uh, analysis runs into social complexity and inertia and fears, and we can just go on and on. And I have to some extent there in the book, Choosing Earth. Um, what I want to say is that the biggest challenge I see is the unwillingness of institutions to challenge the structures that contain them and that contain the dialogue, that contain the conversation. And the, if we expand the framework, uh, wide, deep, and long, it will give more air in which to breathe into workable pathways into the future ahead. Um, people are suffocating in these institutions because they can't get outside of the containment that is expected of them. I've seen this again and again and again. And, and so I would really encourage you to somehow in some way do that. And um, so then that, I'm just going to make this short. That will bring me then to the third element here. And that is bringing in the voice of uh, citizens in the in this country and other parts of the world. And uh, I know you've all probably seen this, the uh, UN climate chief, um, what, his last name is Steele, is that right, uh, Kelly? Um, so uh, he said in a, in a speech just a few days ago, that uh, Simon Steele, we have two years in which to solve the climate crisis. You know, I think we've got a little more than that. But nonetheless, this is the head of the UN Climate uh, Convention. And um, he, in his talk, he said, as of today, uh, by 2030, the, uh, the, uh, he expects no movement no measurable, no significant movement in, uh, in, in cutting climate emissions. Then he goes on to the very end, and this is the key part, based upon his deep understanding of the um, bureaucracy. He is part of it. He said uh, a recent survey by Gallup, 130,000 people in 25 countries found that 89%, 89%, wanted stronger government action. Overwhelming mandate for action. Step outside of the uh, the containers, understand what's happening, and begin to act. Then he says, and I'd like to quote this, one sure way to get climate, climate up the cabinet agenda is if enough people raise their voices. People everywhere, every voice matters. You have never been more important. If you want bolder climate action now, this is the time to make your voice heard. Now, um, this is how I felt um, after years of working uh, in the traditional think tank environment with places like the, the National Science Foundation and such, um, as well as corporations. We the if we are in deep trouble here as a species uh, going into the uh, coming two or three decades. Uh, within that, I think uh, it's we will be in irreversible the ir irreversible change will just grab hold and we will not have the maneuverability that we have right now. So then that brings in 
uh, how in the world do we bring in the voices of the people of the earth? And um, so I just want to speak briefly about the whole idea of earth voice, earth voice, because it's not just earth voice, it's country voice uh, that becomes earth voice and so on. So this is relevant to the uh, mandate that you folks have, I feel. Um, and so people say, well, look, choosing earth, how do you choose it? How do you choose living on the earth? And I, I tell people about a, uh, a meeting I had at Google uh, with one of their executives a few years back. And I said, look, we need to talk together as people of the earth. Uh, we need the technology to come together to support a dialogue among the people of the earth that's of global scale. And he kind of leaned back in his chair. Uh, he looked at me for a long while. And he said, you know, you really don't understand, do you? And he said, what you want, we already have. That was our job. We build it. Uh, it's your job to use it. And so I started doing the research. And he is totally right. In 2018, 50% 50 of the people on the planet got access to a mobile phone in 2018, 50%. Now, six years later, six years later, that 50% has gone to two thirds of the people on the planet have mobile phones. They're carrying mobile phones and anytime they want, they have access to the technologies that will connect us as a species. Now there, there's firewalls or governments that don't want that to happen. Uh, but nonetheless, the technology is there, and it's a matter of governance, once again, to use that technology, and that's a matter of public uh, crying out. We want a voice. So uh, in another few years, uh, by the end of this decade, uh, it will be not 65%, it will be 75% estimates. 75% uh, of the people will have one of these. And you could have a um, a world leader, a, a trusted uh, leaders and organizations. They would say, well, look, uh, what do you want? Do you consider yourself a citizen of the earth? And they can say, yes. Uh, are you concerned about climate action? 89%, yes. Uh, do you want strong response now? Yes. Now, if you have that kind of mandate, for the work that you're doing right now, to expand the perspective, to know there's a mandate of public awareness and concern that is holding her back while you confront the institutional resistances, I'm confident that you, you are. Uh, there's potential there for, uh, for really moving ahead in ways that are responsive or more equal, more proportionate to the challenges, the extraordinary challenges uh, uh, that humanity is facing right now. So enough said, there's about a half hour and uh, there's plenty of time then to uh, have a conversation. Thank you, Duane. And you've given us all a lot to think about. Um, and I, we'll just raise our hands like we normally do and we'll kind of go through the list um, of okay. questions for now. Uh, Jim. I, you know, I, I appreciate your comments there. I, I think one, one hopeful sign recently, I think, is the way, um, at least in this country, I'm not sure about around the world, but at least in this country, women really spoke up about abortion rights and they voted for abortion rights and, and surprised a lot of people. And, you know. and so uh, that, that, that leads me to believe that um, perhaps with more awareness of just what you say, how, how, um, how the ecosystems are in trouble today in the New York Times. There was an article about how coral reefs are going through a hor horrendous warming. Uh, that maybe maybe that might might carry over, and and we might get uh, uh, perhaps led by mothers, you know, supported by others who are worried about their kids. Um, could could really lead. Perhaps that could turn turn uh, cause a, a, an important important effect. Yes. Um, what comes up for me is uh, translating 
those kinds of trends, let's say the Atlantic circulation, the uh, acidification in the coral reefs and on and on, uh, from data and let's say biological analysis, expanding that into stories. That, because we respond to narratives as a species. Uh, we're just programmed through our, our structure. We're a social species and we talk to one another through stories, through narratives. So then the question is, well, what's the narrative that's being developed here uh, by all of this data? It's an extraordinary narrative, the narrative of the largest project that humanity has ever undertaken, which goes beyond uh, the uh, material conditions uh, to the social, psychological, and others. And uh, importantly, and you, I don't need to tell you this, it looks at the oceans, not just at the land and the people on the land, it looks at the whole system. Um, so if we can come up with narratives uh, that naturally flow into, let's say, an ocean mentality, and people relate to this, uh, those narratives could to gather, if you can gather the data of what the next 10 years suggests and describe that, not necessarily it was one scenario, but rather several. So people can see the path ahead is dividing and we have choice and we better make our voices heard as we see those choices more clearly. And yes, I want to come back to what you said that uh, I take heart. The people are waking up. Uh, that Gallup poll of these uh, countries uh, indicates that, but somehow that uh, their their waking up is not being heard. You know, another story might be um, the global brain is waking up, uh, and we're a part of that process. Well, you, you're providing all that data. The global brain is waking up, and here's what it has to tell us. And this is where artificial intelligence and the narrative could, could include that. So in other words, the creative capacities that you folks have uh, is, is being way underutilized, it'd be my guess, uh, to go from, from the data sets to the narrative uh, that holds them all together. So uh, thank you for that uh, comment. It just inspired me <laughs> to <laughs> encourage you in that way. Thank you. Uh, Ajit, Thank you. Thank you very much. Your uh, statistic that two-thirds of the people have a smartphone of some sort and yes. uh, have access to information is, for me, uh, um, very thought-provoking in that um, I can see how it has made such a big difference to uh, people in India, for example, who can do all kinds of transactions that were not possible before. But it is also a place where... Um, where we used to be gatekeepers of knowledge and we are not anymore. And there is knowledge of all kinds that's flowing around. So last night when I was having dinner with some friends, there was this whole question from a 14 year old as to whether AMOC is going to shut down next year and whether life as we know it is basically over. And you know that's basically gleaned from the headlines of a newspaper. And I'm just trying to figure out from what you were saying in terms of the narratives that can be told and how the information is spread, your thoughts on, how one does it right, if there is even one way to do it right. <laughs> no, I don't think there's, uh, we're all, all of us are struggling here. I I feel my, in my experience, to find our way through this. And we're going to make mistakes. Uh, we're going to best effort. And um, we're going to have to go from the knowledge that we have to wisdom. And that's where the uh, the academics uh, can be keepers of wisdom because we have mountains of data. Uh, and somehow we need to come at this in new ways that reflect the, the extraordinary demand for wisdom. What is the wise understanding of what is happening now? Uh, in 20 years, we won't have the uh, opportunity to to bring our wisdom to bear, uh, perhaps. Um, we'll be in such breakdown and conflict, perhaps. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, we're, I, I immerse in our artificial intelligence, like I'm sure most of, most of you are, using those kinds of systems, but we are in new territory, uh, as just keeps, uh, 
unfolding. So let's unfold that back into our capacities for how we can create narratives. For example, you can ask chat, GBT, come on, here's the data, give me the narrative that describes that. Well, it's the global brain is waking up and well, here are the images of people doing that and how they converse in the, and they converse not out of materialism and buying things, but out of uh, a sense of wanting the well-being of life on this planet uh, and talking together about that. We need narratives that connect their data and what you're seeing with the actions uh, that suggest that are suggested by that. And and I realize that's probably way outside your legal venue, but somehow we have to break out of these constraints uh, if we're going to have a viable future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was just sorry, I was reading Layla's um, comment in the chat. That's a great comment. Uh, before we move on, Layla, do you want to talk about that? I didn't see the comment. Should I, can you summarize? No, I, I didn't mean to jump in front of anyone else and I, I didn't really have a question, but um, oh. I, I connected really uh, quite a bit with your comment about the compelling narratives and maybe the scale of narrative that, you know, when the narrative is everything and all of life on earth, it's too, it's yeah. too much to um, comprehend, but simple things like the nearly complete lack of affordable crawfish in the Gulf Coast region, because the excessive heat of last summer and fall has completely Great. decimated the population. And, yes. and that's something that any community can connect to and understand and maybe use as a path to deeper learning on the topic. Yes. So you could be suggesting 10,000 mini narratives uh, you know, do the, you know because you have the data say we don't know the answer to this or how it would be presented but here it is here it is here it is and someone there I know all of these people doing video work and and media work is exploding uh, but but they're not connecting deeply with the information that is being uh, provided and I've struggled with all these data set the masses of information. And but and then bringing it down into a story, a scenario, um, whatever you want to call it, that uh, that brings it to life, makes it real, shows it. So yes, I think that's so important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jason uh, is next, and poor Jason, I think it's um, nearing eleven p.m. where he is. So thank you for hanging on there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and greetings from Trump so uh, tonight. So, uh, Dwayne, thank you for your talk. Uh, I've been involved with a lot of scenario planning and Aussies and MSEs and modeling. I'm a modeling geek, so I, I get all of what you're saying. One of the questions I have for you, building exactly on what Layla and Ajit were getting at, can you point us to you know, two or three sources of a good methodology to construct scenarios that would be helpful for this committee to look at. You're kind of, as Layla hinted, you're kind of saying climate change, the whole planet, we're, we're stuffed. But maybe if we do the crawfish <laughs> scenario, or maybe, and there might be other elements of scenarios that we would like to look at, um, you know, and Ajit mentioned AMOC, but there, there are tons of other things we could be looking at. I'm just trying to anticipate from NSF's perspective, what might be if we were to run some, if you'll allow the phrase, because I'm an analytical modeler, a, a semi-quantitative approach, a semi-quantitative modeling scenario, if we were to run a dozen of those and could maybe tease out like the top three or four that they really ought to look at, is there a methodology or an approach or a way we could do that that would have the academic rigor versus just, you know, what what I get a lot of or, or people saying, oh, you just cherry pick it. So that's right. If, if you could point yeah. us to something like that, I think that would be really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The uh, so the 
the scenario I developed that's in uh, the book Choosing Earth <clears throat> was at 56, 58 pages, something like that. It's a really uh, deep, deep, uh, so much scholarship. That went, I went through well over 10,000 pages of personal writing to come down to a little over 100 of what you actually hold in your hands. Um, that 10,000 pages more was uh, really information, distillation, if you will. Um, now, what I want to get right to the point that you're asking. Uh, what I struggled <laughs> with is, and the neck, the first, um, the period from uh, 2020 to to 2040, that 20 year uh, window is uh, deeply re researched there in uh, the book Choosing Earth. Huge amounts of, of data went into that. Uh, around 2040, things begin to get uh, really, they break. Uh, systems break down, all kinds of breakdowns are happening by 2040s. And that's when we're in, in the full transition, I, I feel. So there are chunks of, of scenarios that lend themselves with kind of systems analysis and feedback loops that you're, I think you're talking about. And I've done those. And um, uh, while working at the, at the uh, uh, Stanford Research Institute, um, so we could, we could speak about that because it, there's self-consistency. If some systems are breaking down, others have to be moving in a way that's consistent with that breakdown, like AMOC, let's say, or acidification or whatever. So there's self-consistency among the different uh, elements of the whole, uh, let's say, the ocean system. So um, that would be the first part. But then once the breakdowns begin, uh, the question is, well, is is that the end of the story? No, in my estimation, for a lot of people, they're saying, yeah, well, that's the end of the story. I'm just saying we're beginning then this the follow-on story of breakthrough. How do we move through these challenging times? We can see it coming. It's coming in the cars. You know, 2040 is only 15 years away. It's not a you know a lifetime away. It's yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Maybe I didn't ask the question. Clearly, I'll try to sharpen it. I follow everything you're saying. I'm picking up what you're laying down. What I'm asking is, is there a methodology, you know, not your scenario, not what you're saying. I don't think a lot of people would independently come up with the same things. Right. But right. is there a recommended methodology we can pick up and recommend to NSF that, hey, they might uh -huh. want to start looking at this more, more in depth? Great question. Is that helpful? Yeah. Very point. Yeah, great question. And I would say until roughly the time frame you are being mandated to describe, uh, there has been a fairly rigorous uh, systems. And I have a huge amount of, uh, this is a big conversation because I think uh, the corporate mindset of profit making, constraining how what you can look at, and and so on, has had a huge influence on scenario uh, development uh, in in the world, and um, it's sort of a spin off from corporate uh, monies that we've got in, uh, many of these scenarios. So I would say uh, first, of all, I would say get in a nutshell, no, there's no single. Uh, system that I can point to, because the, the ones that we can point to are maybe uh, data analysis, where you look at uh, reverberations among complex systems of physical uh, systems. But then, well, what if the, uh, a realistic scenario in today's world requires bringing in uh, economic perturbations and disturbances and so on, and how they might impact, as well as the governing processes. Look at the conflicts in the world right now. Can we come together in any meaningful degree of uh, coordination and control? So that pushes back to you. And it says, look, help us develop the, the data. We can we could work together on that, the, uh, because that's rigorous. So you can grab hold of that. And uh, you can come up with modeling systems and that are suggestive. I could 
perhaps suggests. Uh, but bringing in these other dimensions requires uh, going from knowledge to wisdom, going from, uh, well, I know the material out there, but you're sitting there, you've been on the job, you got gray hairs there, I see them, and uh, you've been on the job. And yes, they wore you down a little there. <laughs> so uh, then it's the wisdom you carry in your life experience that really begins to inform the scenario, scenario as a narrative, not just a data set, it's a narrative of what is happening. So the policymaker can say, okay, uh, I see there's a bunch of information behind this. What I'm grabbing hold of is the description that I can bridge between me and my uh, constituents, whoever th those might be. And you, so we have to start being effective policy bridge makers, if you will. Um, not pushing a point of view, but rather saying, here are multiple, maybe three points of view, like in Choosing Earth, the book, three different scenarios. Uh, and then it describes one in depth. So uh, I think I feel that's the challenge uh, in many, way many ways ahead of, you have an impossible task looking at the next decade just as um, information uh, because it calls for uh, knowledge <laughs> and more deeply wisdom. Uh, so more power to you. It's a, I just, I don't know how you're going to bring it all in, but uh, I'll help any way I can. Thank you, uh, Mona. Duane, thank you so much for your insightful remarks. Um, I must say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, I'm a little depressed. <laughs> uh, not that it's a surprise, but you know, it still, um, it still makes me wonder. Uh, and actually, underscore yeah. the importance of local solutions. Yeah. So even the the uh, the policy innovations that you're talk talking about, I think they're. They're best um, handled at the local level, and uh, you know where you can test and try, and then probably scale them up or down, if and as need be. Um, it's also, you know, as a global citizen, if I may call myself that, I, I think it's a little overwhelming to think about the the you know your role or the role that your science can play in global scale problems. And I it once again emphasizes the importance for local, you know, leveraging traditional and local knowledge, perhaps local wisdom uh, to develop those solutions at a local level. My question to you is um, innovations happen at the local policy level all the time. I can give examples of climate uh, adaptation, for example, but the scale and the pace at which these innovations happen, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we accelerate that because I think that's needed to make mistakes to learn lessons and to and to share broadly whatever works for whatever right. community at the local level at a massive scale so right. how, how do you how do you uh you know if you can if you can comment on that <laughs> yeah. on closing the gap between scale yes. and the pace of innovation that'd be very yeah. helpful thank you yes okay great uh you I wrote a book uh, titled Voluntary Simplicity. And it is passionately about finding a smaller scale on which to live our lives more simply and with more neighborliness and all the rest so we can comprehend what's going on and make innovations that really are genuine adaptions to, to the needs. Um, so uh, how do we do it? How do we do it? We got to talk to one another to do this. Um, we're we're in in a crisis condition. We're we're already there because we know what's coming and it's coming fast. Uh, how do we do this? Well, two thirds. Well, now three. We're coming up on three quarters of the people on the planet have one of these, uh, and the majority of those people are really concerned about the well being of of the earth and and the oceans and all of us. So um, this is this is crazy making. We have the tools. We have the 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 point of view, the sentiments, the uh, what we want as a species. Uh, we have the data sets that inform that, uh, but they're not coming together to create that. So uh, we need to go from a decentralized local level. 
uh, creating these self-organizing communities, uh, eco villages to eco cities to eco civilizations. We need to have an ecological revolution happening on the earth. And we can do it if we just talk to one another. If we agree around the earth, look, uh, let's all be entrepreneurs and let's have a new kind of entrepreneurship. But it's not to create the most wealth for, for a few. It's rather to create the most exciting, in, just informed, creative life for all of us. Uh, now, if we had the leadership to call us out an ecological transformation, an eco-civilization at every scale, and there was some image of what that meant, uh, people would be excited. They'd say, well, yeah, I love to garden. I love to be in community with others. I really am passionate about solar. And you understand what I'm saying? People connect around those decentralized solutions. But we, at the same time, need to be mindful that we can create uh, solutions at the global scale, picking up the phone. That simple. Um, so we are disempowered, needlessly disempowered as a species. We have the tools to come together, to talk together, and to reorient how these governing systems work, the NSFs of the world and all of us, and how what they fund and what comes out of that. So I, I realize that you you wanted to speak more pointedly, perhaps about uh, scenarios. I'm happy to go back to that, uh, but um, it's the social, more inclusive uh, human dimension uh, with narratives and decentralized initiatives and all the rest that's missing uh, from uh, the mix right now. Enough said. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, we have about 10 minutes. Um, are there any other questions from the committee? I think, um, you know, it's, this is deep. <laughs> We've got all a lot on our minds right now. Um, I don't know if y'all had had a chance. Oh, go for it, Chrissy. Um, I think this is a, is a great talk, a great discussion. I'm, I'm just wondering, because I'm, I'm thinking about past situations where you've put a date to on the timeline of when these events are going to occur. And I wonder if you guys have considered the risk that, that poses if those dates come and go and how that affects the overall message, which is important. Uh, I think it is very important what you're saying um <laughs> confidence and uh so uh, let me just say this uh in 1978 uh i wrote a long scenario for abc television they wanted to look at the deep future through the lives of uh, three different families living through the future simultaneously and they said uh we're going to, we're writing in 1978, but we'll, let's start the scenario in the year 2000, just go from there. And so I did. I wrote a scenario for them that was turned into a uh, screenplay and went all the way up to production and then canceled uh, for another one called The Winds of War with Robert Mitchum. And, but this is a scenario about a transformation, really. And in this scenario, I said 1980 or uh, 2025 will be the time when two global mindsets come into, they cross. Uh, one is a materialistic mindset that says we're here as material beings and, and we're here to consume and be happy. The other mindset simply said, said, you know, we live in a living system. The earth has a living system and it is full of living things, life. And part of our work as mature human beings is to take care of it. And um, so there's another uh, uh, way of uh, kind of looking at it. Um, so I feel this is uh, pivotal. 
Uh, and I, I put my life on the line to say, well, by 2025, I want to be on um, on call. On, <laughs> I want to be busy working for the curve that bends beyond materialism, between, beyond that kind of profit seeking and so on. You know, I have an MBA from the Wharton Business School. I say that with with uh, uh, with some understanding what I'm speaking about, but um, uh, so there I was in 1978, and then it was uh, what uh, I don't know, 46 years, whatever later, that uh, we get to 2025. So I sometimes uh, scenarios are really on target and they're correct. There is one. It was exactly to 2025 saying we start making this pivotal choice. Uh, now in 2025, let's say, uh, or we are going to run into an evolutionary wall, uh, an ecological wall, an evolutionary wall, the evolutionary wall we run into ourselves. Uh, and we just collide with our own uh, arrogance, if you will, as a species, I, I suppose. So, um, so that, uh, there were just some reflections on that, but I think it's really important to try to um, be as accurate as possible. And I just turned that in, I've been writing about the 2020s, for example, for decades. So it's no big uh, surprise that now's the time. If back in uh, 1975, the Department of Energy, they could say, look, in 30 or 40 years, it turns out that's now, uh, we're going to be in big trouble. People have known this for a long time. And so we're just not stepping up to the game quite yet. And, and I've done a lot of work on uh, history. And there's one lament that uh, civilizations have had through history uh, because they've seen what's happening. They tried to respond, uh, but they didn't respond quickly enough. So the lament is too little and too late. We know what's going on. Uh, we're doing some things, you know, 1.5 is crossed, but hey, we're still doing some things. Uh, it's pretty little. Uh, is it going to be soon enough to avoid this evolutionary uh, wall, if you will. I don't think so. I think we're going to hit it. We're going to, there's going to be breakup and out of that breakup, there's going to be breakthrough as we come uh, into a new relationship with the earth. Um, so, um, so, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I read an interesting article recently that was talking about the uh, collapse of coral reefs owing to a warming ocean, but not all reefs. And the point the point was made in the article that okay, not all reefs are going to collapse, but let's let's make sure other things don't screw up the ones that that um, that did survive the warmings. For example, pollution of uh, due to land or you know erosion or other types of pollution and so on. And it seemed to me that that's that approach might. Uh, might be applied more generally as we face some of the severe ecological consequences of warming and, and acidification and so on. You bet. Save what we can. Um, yeah, fully agree. Fully agree. I, I'm curious uh, to what extent, because I push the envelope, so to speak, here in this conversation to say, we got to look at the governing structures, systems, narratives, scenario stories, to just push wide, deep and long. Uh, how does that land here? I mean, I my heart goes out to you because I worked inside of um, these huge bureaucracies. And it was that experience that pushed me to say, there are limits to the management of large complex systems. And those large complex systems are going to be slow to respond to the challenges of a fast moving uh, world in, in ecological breakdown. And I think that's the condition we're seeing ourselves in right now. And so this juncture between those two critical sets of systems, well, the economy and sociology and spirituality, the 
whole thing is being challenged to reconfigure itself to relate to the world in a new way with eight, nine billion people uh, by the end of 2030, what, eight, nine billion people. Uh, so uh, what an extraordinary time of, of um, innovation. Uh, and the creative potential right now to make a small change now will be magnified into enormous changes down the road. So this is one of those unique disjunctures, uh, breaks in human history when we we don't know quite what we're doing. We've never done this before. We've never had to go into this kind of uh, new condition before. We've never been in massive overshoot and collapse as a species. Uh, so we're all struggling here. Uh, and anyone that tells you they have a clear understanding of what's going on, I, I say, no, no, we're all uh, giving it our best. But boy, we're all struggling here to make sense of a world in such profound uh, uh, transition and change. So once again, where I started was uh, with gratitude. And, and as we move towards close, I want to express my gratitude as well, that you're willing to struggle with this, be with this. And uh, I'm going to be one of the persons that wants to see the report that comes out here uh, about the uh, next decadal period. <laughs> Thank you so there's much. A, there is an inter um, there's an interesting contrast between the near paralysis of the U.S. Congress, and but... Uh, with with many towns and cities <laughs> doing some very creative things, both uh, for for the local ecology, for the for to respond to climate change, and so on, and so that's that's sort of encouraging. It's almost yes. like, well, national yeah. government maybe can't do it, but we're going to do it. I think that's right. See, I think people understand that it's not working. It's been a stalemate for so long now. And the people are saying, well, we're going to have to take charge here at the local level because the, the, the higher levels are not, they're just not doing the job. And in some ways, I don't think they can. I think we're in such, it, it isn't, it, the world needs to be reconfigured with a realism that we have. Uh, we're moving towards nine and 10 billion people on the planet and we're in massive overshoot, massive migration, massive die offs of species, on and on. I see the time, our our time is up. So I wanna respect that, but uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to um, be a, con a contributor. That's, yeah. It means a lot. So thank you. I look forward to your report. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Yeah. Um, and I'll let you know when the when the recording is posted. Um, oh, okay. And we'll keep you updated uh, on the process. So, um, Great. really appreciate you joining us and everyone on the committee. Thanks so much for for joining us as well. Yes. Um, and we'll uh, let you go right on time. Well Great. done. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, everyone.